Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for your patience. You've joined the Q1 Fiscal 2019 Athena Retail Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will be given at that time. Should you require any additional assistance during the call, please press star then zero on your touchtone telephone. As a reminder, this conference may be recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Jennifer Davis, ICR. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to Athena's first quarter fiscal 2019 earnings call and webcast. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that certain statements and information made available on today's call and webcast may be deemed to constitute forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements reflect the company's current expectations as of December 10, 2018, and are subject to a number of known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. The company undertakes no obligation to revise or update any forward-looking statements. Additionally, today's call and webcast may refer to non-GAAP financial measures. A reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP measures discussed today is included in our earnings release, a copy of which was filed with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission in a current report on Form 8K earlier today. Please refer to the Foreign Investors section of AthenaRetail.com for a replay of today's conference call. Note that the company has posted a supplemental slide package to augment information provided on today's call on its IR website and attached to its 8K released earlier today. Hosting today's call are David Jaffe, Athena's Chief Executive Officer, Gary Muto, President and CEO of Athena Brands, Brian Lynch, President and Chief Operating Officer, and Rob Gimiteo, Athena's Chief Financial Officer. Thank you, and I will now hand the call over to David. Thanks, Jen. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Our first quarter results represent another step forward in our journey to transform Athena into a more agile, profitable company. We deliver a 3% comp sales increase driven by strength at our premium and kids segments. Earnings per share of $0.06 came in at the top of our guide driven by better-than-expected top-line growth. Our performance this quarter further increases our confidence that the investments we are making in brand initiatives and our efforts to build out enhanced capabilities will enable us to drive shareholder value. From a brand initiative standpoint, we have seen strong performance from Justice's loyalty program and rapid growth of the new digital channels at Ann Taylor Factory and Loft Outlet. We are also funding strategic initiatives such as Loft Plus and Cacique where we believe we have meaningful long-term opportunity. Importantly, we continue to enhance our customer insights capabilities to ensure our brand teams are delivering solutions for our customer that address both her product and experience needs. From a capability standpoint, we are working to embed advanced analytics into all aspects of our business, including machine learning-based forecast models and predictive and automated marketing campaign tools. We have made meaningful investments over the past two years to enhance full ticket sell-through and improve inventory productivity, and fiscal 2019 will see the implementation of these capabilities that should serve to enhance organic performance at our brands. Looking back at the first quarter, while enterprise comp sales growth exceeded our expectations, we have more work to do to improve the consistency of performance across our portfolio. We were very pleased with the performance of both our premium and kids segments and believe we have opportunity to further differentiate and tell our loft and justice from competitors to drive continued growth. Our value segment experienced another difficult quarter, but importantly, we are seeing performance stabilize the dress barn and are encouraged by the initial signs of recovery. We've also seen improvement in the trend at Maurice's from the August-September period with positive comp performance over the past two months. At Lane Bryant, we were disappointed in our apparel performance. We spoke last quarter about our need to see Lane Bryant apparel turn to positive growth, but we missed the mark. The plus apparel sector is becoming increasingly competitive, and we must up our game. In addition to addressing a near-term fashion miss, we are moving aggressively to reposition Lane Bryant for the spring season, inclusive of a major rebranding effort based on work that has been in development since this past summer. Looking forward into our second quarter, 
We were pleased with the kickoff to our holiday selling period with quarter-to-date comp sales up 4%. Specific to the Black Friday Cyber Monday peak, as measured over the 11-day period leading to Cyber Monday, enterprise comp sales and margin were both up 7%, driven by significant continuing strength in our premium segment. Overall, we are pleased with the start of the fiscal year as our first quarter represented another step forward. We have built a solid foundation over the course of our transformation, consisting of new brand leadership and significantly enhanced enterprise capabilities. We've built on this foundation with an enhanced understanding of our customer based on the extensive customer insights work we've completed across our brand portfolio. We believe our efforts are beginning to produce positive results, and we are focused on building upon our momentum. In parallel with the execution of strategic brand growth initiatives, we continue to evaluate all opportunities to drive increased shareholder value, including ongoing assessment of our brand portfolio, development of our platform capability to enable delivery of third-party services, and potential new channels of distribution. With that, I'll hand things over to Gary to discuss key developments across our brand portfolio. Gary? Thanks, David. Our first quarter performance was driven by continuing momentum at Justice and Loft and a very positive inflection point at Ann Taylor. Justice delivered comparable sales growth of 12%, representing its third consecutive quarter of double-digit growth. Performance was driven by a strong back-to-school season and broad-based customer acceptance of our assortment, evidenced by growth across transactions, average selling price, and units per transaction. Importantly, Justice growth was balanced with double-digit comp increases in both stores and duress, and across both apparel and specialty. Within the stores channel, traffic was up mid-single digits, highlighting the brand's ability to offer unique physical experiences, such as fashion shows and dance parties, which we call magic moments. We are building on our offering of these differentiated in-store experiences, including birthday parties and ear piercing, which enhances Justice's unique relationship with our girl. In addition, we are very pleased with the rapid growth of Club Justice Loyalty Program since its launch last October. Over 4.4 million customers have enrolled in the program, and we are seeing significant engagement from members, which purchases account for about 7% of our total retail sales. We estimate that Club Justice added a full comp point of sales this past quarter and we have just begun to learn how to maximize the opportunity presented from the program. Turning to Loft, we continue to see strong momentum with comp sales up 9% and comp margin up 11%. Performance was driven by strong customer acceptance of the fashion assortment in our full price channel with average selling price up 8%. On the assortment side, we were specifically pleased with the strength in sweaters, petites, and blue and gray which represents one of our long-term growth initiatives. Our wholesale test with blue and gray selling into Nordstrom's continues to progress well, and we are exploring opportunities to further leverage this relationship. We were also pleased with the ramp of our recently launched outlet online channel and are now seeing high teen penetration to the total loft outlet business with minimal cannibalization of the store's business. We continue to incubate our Loft Plus initiative with learnings from our 50 store pilot and our online business being used to refine our go-forward strategies. Ann Taylor had a very strong quarter, with comp sales up 7% and comp margin up 9%. Performance was driven by the full price channel with an increase of 7% in average selling price, reflecting a broad customer acceptance of our fall fashion deliveries. Assortment performance was driven, driven by dresses and petites And importantly, we realized positive growth in our tops business, which we have highlighted as essential to returning Antella to sustained growth. We were also pleased with the launch of our factory online channel, which, consistent with Lost Outlet Online, delivered double-digit penetration in its first full quarter of operation. Performance improved sequentially at our value segment through the first quarter. With a challenging transition period in August and September, partially offset by improvement in October, I'll start with Dressborn. As we discussed on our last call, we had consciously managed Dressborn inventory to very conservative levels as we exited fiscal 2018 to allow the new brand leadership team to position the assortment to reflect the aesthetic of our mid-50-year-old core customer. The decision has allowed us to get 
good reads on customer acceptance of our fall fashion as these deliveries did not compete with lower price final clearance goods. In aggregate, Dress Barn's fall fashion floor sets has delivered double-digit positive sales growth on inventory levels that were down mid-single digits. The customer reaction to our rebalanced assortment has provided insight for the team to make informed inventory investments for the second quarter to grow the business as we move deeper into fiscal 2019. Moving to Maurice's, we've experienced a very challenging transitional period resulting from inventory buy that lacked newness and adequate depth in key fashion items. We saw a marked improvement in the business trend in October as comp sales turned positive due to improved product acceptance and more effective promotional strategy. We continue to adjust our forward inventory buys to ensure we have appropriate depth in key fashion items this spring. We are also continuing to test strategies to mitigate ongoing store traffic headwinds, including targeting our digital spend locally around store locations and enhancing our loyalty program. In parallel, we're beginning to see benefits related to competitive store closures as stores co-located with Bonton locations delivered comp performance that was four percentage points higher than the balance of the chain. We look forward to building on these factors going forward to mitigate the strong traffic declines we've been experiencing. Finally, our plus segment. As David mentioned, we were very disappointed in Lane Bryant, which took a step backwards this past quarter. After a good start in August, performance was impacted by fashion misses in our top assortment, resulting in significant trend change, change which persisted into our second quarter. Lane Bryant Apparel ended the first quarter with cost sales down 2% and we anticipate apparel comp performance to remain challenging through the second quarter as we work to reposition our tops assortment. Despite the SOPS challenge, we sourced growth in our denim dress and our active assortment for the quarter. Physique Intimates delivered another quarter of positive comp growth, but performance was below our expectations. We continue to see strong acceptance of our fashion bras, but are starting to see pricing pressure in the more basic parts of our bra and panty assortment as new entrants and large incumbents compete for market share. We must get Lane Bryant back on track, and I'm spending a disproportionate amount of my time working with the team, leadership team to address the near-term apparel weaknesses and ensure our strategies for accelerated PC growth are well-developed. Due to Lane Bryant's importance to our enterprise growth objective, we have been developing a comprehensive brand positioning and rebranding strategy over the past six months to re-engage the customers that left the brand and attract new ones. We have the near-term apparel challenges addressed as we move past holiday and look forward to beginning the rollout of our new brand and product positioning as we transition into late spring. In closing, we are very pleased with the enterprise-level performance. We must deliver more consistent performance across our brand portfolio. We are focused on maintaining the momentum at Justice, Lawson, and Taylor and quickly remediating the assortment misses at Lane Bryant. We are seeing stabilization in our value segment and are working aggressively to regain some of the lost ground from last year. With that, I'll hand off to Brian for a brief update on our transformation work. Thanks, Gary, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll now provide a brief update on our Change for Growth transformation program and the associated capabilities we are building in support of our brand teams. We remain on track to our $300 million cost takeout figure and are working on additional opportunities to take this figure higher. Major contributors to fiscal 2019 cost reductions include non-merchandise procurement savings, IT efficiencies related to our Global Innovation Center in Bangalore, and our continued work with fleet optimization. Specific to our fleet optimization program, landlord negotiations continue to be very productive, and we remain confident we will achieve the targeted $60 million in cumulative lease concessions across our portfolio by July of 2019. In terms of our capabilities, we accomplished a lot during the first quarter. We expanded our operational capabilities in Bangalore beyond core IT. Examples include digital contact center, marketing, and merchandise operations. As David referenced earlier, we continue, we continue our work to enhance our analytic capability and support of merchandise margin. We completed the implementation of markdown and size pack optimization across our portfolio earlier this calendar year and have begun rollout of our new localized demand planning capability. We expect this machine learning based forecasting capability to be implemented across all of our brands this coming spring. JDA allocation is also now live at both Justice and our plot segment. We expect to roll it out to the remainder of our portfolio in calendar 2019. 
We expect all of these capabilities will be uh, will build on each other to enhance our full price sell through and improve in inventory productivity. Additionally, we expect to begin realizing benefits associated with optimization of our omni channel fulfillment engine and refinement of our brand promotional offers this spring. We anticipate our capabilities in these areas will continue to expand as we mature our advanced analytics center of excellence. We remain on course in the development of our customer experience management ecosystem, including an automated suite of marketing, analytics, and campaign tools, which will allow personalization of brand message and promotional offers at scale. We anticipate these tools to come online in calendar 2019. Our loyalty programs at both Maurice's and Justice have proven successful, and our premium and plus segments are scheduled to launch in calendar 19. In our continued efforts to expand our global sourcing capabilities, we are le leveraging lower cost and in increasing our innovation offered on the Indian subcontinent and have increased our presence in Bangladesh and India. We expect to ship $70 million uh, in orders out of these countries this fiscal year, further reducing our China exposure. In closing, we remain optimistic that the capabilities we are deploying and the efficiencies we are delivering will enable our brands to more effectively compete in our continuously evolving sector. And with that, here's Rob. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Before I discuss our performance, I want to highlight that my comments on this call will reference non-GAAP results, which exclude restructuring expenses that affect year-on-year -year comparability. In addition, there were two timing-related items in our results that affect year-on-year -year comparability. First, the 53rd week in our prior fiscal year, which moved our peak back-to-school week from week one of our prior year to week 52 in our current year. And second, adoption of the new revenue recognition standard, which spread certain private label credit card revenues across this fiscal year versus prior year recognition in the first quarter. Consistent with past practice, we have posted a supplemental earnings package to our IR website and attached it to our 8K to provide additional context on performance for the quarter. I will refer to this document in my prepared remarks and may reference it as well during Q&A. As David referenced earlier, we delivered first quarter earnings of $0.06 cents per share. Comp sales were up 3%, driven by balanced growth across units and average selling price. Comp transactions were essentially flat, with our direct channel up close to 20% and our store channel down 4%. First quarter direct penetration was 29%, reflecting an approximate four percentage point increase from fiscal 2018, driven in part by the new digital channels for Ann Taylor Factory and Loft Outlet. Total revenue was essentially flat to the year ago period, with comparable sales growth offset by a lower store count resulting from our fleet optimization work and a combined unfavorable impact of the 53rd week timing shift and the new revenue recognition standard. Gross margin rate of 59.4% was down 130 basis points to last year, with increased direct penetration contributing approximately 30 basis points to the decline, with the remainder caused by lower merchandise margin rates at our kids, plus, and value segments. The expected rate decline at our kids segment was primarily related to product mix associated with accelerated growth of Justice's back-to-school assortment and the 53rd week timing shift. The declines in our plus and value segments were primarily related to greater markdown levels required to address merchandise missteps, particularly at Lane Bryant and Maurice's. These rate declines were partially offset by significantly improved merchandise margin rate performance at our premium segment. Operating expense of $817 million was up $8 million, or 0.9% for the quarter, with investments in growth initiatives, a reset in performance-based compensation to target levels, increased fulfillment expense, and inflationary pressure, partially offset by transformation-related savings and store closures. Detail is provided in slide 14 of our supplemental slide package. Specific to our transformation program, we realized $23 million in savings in the first quarter, driven by headcount reductions, non-merchandise procurement savings, and fleet optimization. Touching briefly on our fleet optimization program, we ended the first quarter with 4,596 stores, reflecting 26 net, net closures in the quarter. Consistent with our guide, first quarter operating income was down to the year-ago period due to the reset of performance-based compensation to target levels this year, along with the unfavorable combined timing impact of the 53rd week shift and the new revenue recognition standard. As highlighted on slide 10 of our supplemental slide package, 
These items together represented an approximate 32 million drag on first quarter operating income versus the year ago period. Turning to our balance sheet, we ended the first quarter with 199 million in cash and cash equivalents and total debt of 1.372 billion, representing the balance of our term loan. Our next scheduled amortization payment is not due until November 2020, and our asset-based revolver was undrawn at quarter end. Between revolver availability and cash, we had 672 million in liquidity at quarter end. Regarding our capital structure, net debt is 2.7 times trailing 12-month EBITDA, and trailing 12-month EBITDA is 4.5 times our annual interest obligation. From a capital allocation perspective, we continue to believe debt reduction is the best path to generate shareholder value at this time and expect fiscal 2019 free cash flow of 200 to 240 million. At the total company level, we exited for the first quarter with inventory of 830 million, which was up 11% from the year ago period, with approximately half of the increase resulting from receipt timing related to the 53rd week shift. The remainder is related to investments we have made in the business to support our premium and kids segments. Inventory growth at our premium segments supported continued double-digit comp trends at both brands coming into the second quarter, while the investment at our kids segment reflects normalization of prior year inventory, which was down over 20%. Capital expenditures for the first quarter were $32 million. Specific to our second quarter guide, we are expecting a loss of $0.15 to $0.25 cents per share based on the following assumptions. Net sales of 1.675 to 1.705 billion, with comp sales up 2 to 4 percent. Our sales outlook reflects a negative two-point spread between sales growth and comp growth due to the impact of the 53rd week shift referenced a moment ago. Details related to the impact of the 53rd week by quarter throughout fiscal 2019 is highlighted on slide 13 of our supplemental earnings package. Gross margin rate of 54.2 to 54.8 percent with the midpoint up 40 basis points to the year-ago period. The planned rate increase reflects expectations for merchandise margin growth at our premium segment related to continued assortment strength, and importantly, positive rate inflection at our value segment, driven by stabilizing, improved, stabilizing performance at Dress Barn. We expect these increases will be partially offset by higher freight costs related to the ongoing increase in digital penetration, 53rd week timing, and lower merchandise margin rate at Lane Bryant as we work through our first quarter assortment list. And finally, operating, income, operating expense growth of approximately 2%, with the increase caused by inflationary pressure, reset of performance-based compensation to target, and discrete investments in enterprise growth drivers, including the ramp of our recently launched premium segment outlet online channels, our loft plus assortment, and a broader product offering at Kasik Intimates. These investments will be partially offset by ongoing transformation-related savings and store closures. As highlighted on slide 11 of our supplemental package, second quarter earnings will be impacted by the timing shifts related to the 53rd week in our prior fiscal year and the impact of the new revenue recognition standard. Together with the reset of performance-based compensation to target levels, these items result in an approximate drag of $22 million on second quarter operating income versus the year-ago period. Turning to our full-year outlook, while performance was strong through the Black Friday, Cyber Monday week, it is still early in the holiday season, and as such, we are maintaining our fiscal 2019 full-year earnings per share guidance of break-even to $0.10. Cents. Please reference page 9 of our supplemental slide package for detailed assumptions supporting our second quarter and full-year fiscal 2019 guide. As David and Gary noted, while we are pleased with our enterprise comp sales performance, we need to deliver more consistency across our portfolio, and our brand teams are working diligently to make needed adjustments. We remain on track for a year of strong cash generation and plan to continue to delever our balance sheet to create more optionality to opportunistically refinance our term loan on improved terms. We continue to invest in the future of our business and expect to exit fiscal 2019 with meaningful new capabilities that should enhance brand-driven top line and margin rate improvement in support of sustainable earnings growth. That includes our, concludes our prepared remarks and we'll now open it up to questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you have a question at this time, please press star, then one on your touchtone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. To prevent any background noise, we ask that you please place your line on mute once your question has been stated. Once again, please press star, then one on your touchtone telephone at this time to ask a question. Our first question comes from the line of Susan Anderson of B. Riley. 
Your line is open. Hi, good evening. Nice job on the quarter. Um, I guess I was wondering maybe if you could give a little bit more color on Ann Taylor and Loft. It's nice to see the very large improvement there. Maybe if you could talk a little bit about um, what helped to drive that, and then also do you think it's sustainable as we look over the next several quarters? Yeah, uh, hi, this is Gary. Uh, starting with Ann Taylor, I would say the focus on kind of where to work and desk to dinner has definitely been the driving factor of uh, the performance improvement at Ann Taylor. Um, like I mentioned, we saw a significant um, in, uh, performance um, improvement in dresses and petites, as well as what we called out last time as a potential weakness was our tops assortment, and, and we have a new strategy in place that um, we feel very confident will continue to drive that business forward. Um, moving to Loft, you know, I would say similarly, um, a really good understanding of our customer. You know, we had made a few missteps, you know, in previous quarters that we had course corrected, you know, over the, of the, over the past quarter, and we've seen very strong product acceptance, you know, in our fall fashion deliveries, um, you know, specifically, you know, like I mentioned, uh, Petit was a, a strong uh, strong performer. Lewin Gray was a strong performer. Um, and we believe that the momentum will continue as we uh, progress through the, uh, the second quarter. Great. That's helpful. Um, and then, Rob, maybe if you could talk a little bit about, um, as we kind of look at the annual guide, which you reiterated, and then um, – the second quarter guide, I guess just trying to tie in um, the operating margin guide for the year and kind of how we get there in the back half given it looks like first quarter and second quarter over year basis. Susan, you, you broke up at the end there, but just in general, um, you'll remember that the 53rd week is moving a substantial amount of non-comparable sales into the third quarter primarily. So if, you, if you'll if you reference some of the, uh, the supplemental deck, you'll see that there's a big shift that's hurt us in Q1 and Q2. We talked about that uh, in our prepared remarks, but that's going to come back in the third quarter mostly, and that will be a significant benefit on that front. Um, we also are going into some of the more challenged periods in the prior year with our value segment, specifically Dress Barn. And while we certainly don't want to get ahead of ourselves, we feel uh, pretty good that the team's got um, stabilization well underway, and we should be coming up against some softer comps, specifically on the margin side as we get into deeper into the second and specifically the third quarter. Great. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and th I guess just on the value segment, then also maybe if you can just give a little bit of color on the strategies to turn around, um, you know, each of those brands and kind of where you're at with that. Yeah, as, as Gary again, you know, I would say, you know, for Dress Barn, the, you know, the key change we made is really focusing our assortment back to this mid-50 year old co core customer. Um, and, you know, we've seen a, a very nice response to our fashion assortment. So I would say understanding, you know, the customer that we have um, and offering product that is uh, relevant to her needs. The team has also spent a significant amount of time, you know, getting to getting reacquainted with the customer. Um, we've spoken, you know, on previous calls, you know, kind of the methodology that we use with our customer insights team, and that team has done everything from looking at demographics, psychographics, looking at patterning, um, you know, understanding what, what our wardrobe looks like, you know, um, online focus groups, and I think that has been very instrumental. For the, for the team to really understand what her needs are. Um, and I think what we're finding out, you know, there's definitely been a uh, casualization across her wardrobe, and I, we believe that we have product that more reflects her needs. You know, similarly with Maurice's, Maurice's is undergoing the same type of consumer insight work, um, like I just mentioned from, uh, from Dress Barn. We believe that Maurice's, there's a couple things. One, um, we have to buy with conviction. We have to buy key fashion items that we believe are representative of the Maurice's brand and make sure that there's enough depth so when our customer comes into our stores, she can see it and, and purchase it. Similarly, you, you know, also, Maurice's is, you know, getting reacquainted with, the, with their core customer. And I think, you know, the work is underway, um, and I feel very confident that, you know, as we gain these insights, we will move very quickly to turn these insights into actionable strategies. Great. That's helpful. Thanks a lot, you guys. Good luck next quarter. Thanks, Susan. 
Thank you. At this time, I'd like to turn the call back over to David Jaffe for any closing remarks. Well, thanks, everyone, for your interest, and we wish you all the best for a very happy and healthy holiday season. See you in the new year. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation, and have a wonderful day. You may disconnect your lines at this time.